All right, well, here we are live. Well, at least I'm live. Uh, I'm not sure anybody else is live out there tonight. Um, but uh, just take a couple minutes, let people um, sit down to their computers and log on and get adjusted. And um, I guess everybody's uh, excited about tomorrow, excited about hunting. Uh, tomorrow's the first day of um, rifle season. And uh, I know up here on the, on the mountain, uh, there are people everywhere back and forth on uh, four-wheelers and you name it people are everywhere up and down the dirt road um, so uh, we'll just wait a couple minutes let people log on and get comfortable and get their Bibles uh, so we'll just uh, we'll just wait a couple minutes uh, thankful for this opportunity to to share the word once again and uh, just look forward to what uh, God has for us tonight uh, just have something tonight to encourage you. Tonight's not going to be a, a, an in-depth teaching on anything, but I just want to encourage uh, the saints tonight uh, on a couple things as we're uh, coming on live tonight and just um, just thankful for the opportunity to share the word and um, see what God has for us tonight. You know, it's, it's funny, sometimes... You, uh, you can listen to somebody or watch somebody and, um, to be honest, not get anything out of it. And there's some nights, you know, you watch people on TV or whatever, and uh, it's it's exactly what you needed to hear. So uh, I'm just trusting God that, that whatever I say tonight, uh, whatever God has laid on my heart throughout this week, you know, somebody out there needs to hear it, whether it's tonight or whether it's somebody in the future logging on, you know, where uh, we're, uh, you can uh, go YouTube and us and uh, watch our sermons and see what uh, God has. So this might not even be for somebody tonight, but this might be somebody in the future needs to hear a word of encouragement. And that's what I want to do tonight. I want to take this time to encourage the saints uh, because these are... Um, I'm going to talk about this. These are the last of the last days. Amen. We are living in the exciting last days before Jesus comes. Uh, and I want to talk just a little bit about that. Not much, but tonight I want to talk about something that uh, God has laid on my heart. But before we do, why don't we pray? Uh, Father, I just thank you, Lord, tonight for uh, the opportunity once again to share your word. And as we look at the perfect law of liberty tonight, Father. I pray that uh, whatever is said tonight, Father, would first of all glorify you and uh, honor you. But Father, be something tonight that that uh, your Holy Spirit would touch our hearts with, that we would uh, see things in a different light, that Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts concerning uh, maybe a part of our lives that we need to uh, refocus on, part of our lives that we need to... Um, have you minister to? Have you change? So, Father, we just uh, just want to come tonight, uh, and uh, we want to open our hearts to you, open our spiritual ears to you to hear what the Spirit has to say to us tonight. Uh, I just uh, thank you. There'll be no dead air tonight. That it will be a live air. Uh, wherever you are, there is life and light. So, Father, I thank you for your life tonight, and uh, just uh, thank you, Father, for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. So tonight, I want to uh, continue in something. The last two two Sundays, I've been speaking on uh, out, of, out of Joshua chapter 1. We're not going to go there tonight. I uh, hope you have your Bibles with you. We're not going to move all over the place tonight, but uh, uh, I'm going to continue on a, on a vein that I started a couple weeks ago. I spoke two Sundays on uh, being prepared and armed out of Joshua chapter 1 because... Uh, not uh, not every Christian is prepared for every day of their life, for what God has for them. And I think we lose a lot of opportunities uh, to be used by God because we're not because we're not prepared for what God has for us. And uh, tonight's just a continuation of being prepared, not only personally prepared to be used by the Lord, but how we prepare ourselves, for these last days we are in. And if you have a Bible with you, uh, we're going to read out of 2 Timothy 
chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, I'm going to read out of first. Uh, we're going to read verses 1 through 13 to start. But we are, uh, a lot of people don't know it, don't understand it, but we are in the last of the last days. And it's just like scriptures are coming alive. Scriptures are being fulfilled right before our eyes. Uh, events happening around the world that correlate directly back to the Bible. Bible prophecy, everything is happening according to the Bible. And uh, it's so exciting. Amen. It's so exciting to see and to hear uh, what God's doing in these last days and uh, what he's going to do until uh, the rapture of the church, till Jesus comes back uh, for the church. So uh, we look forward to that. But we're gonna, I'm going to read out of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. If you have a Bible, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, 1 through 13. I'm going to start at verse 1. Paul says to Timothy, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. Perilous times. I don't know what your version says, but the New King James says perilous. And just a little description here in my Bible says, uh, The word describes a society that is barren of virtue, but abounding in vices. Isn't, isn't that so much today? Verse 2, for men, listen, if you're in your Bibles, listen to this. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And from such people turn away. Verse 6, for of this sort are those who creep into households and make captive of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Now James and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapproved concerning the faith, but they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all, as theirs also was. Verse 10, But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me in Antioch, at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what per persecutions I endured, and out of them the Lord delivered me. Yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, but evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So we see a, a, a list here, a, a just just a amazing list of things that we see today, amen? It's things that we see today. Uh, those of us that are, um, how should I, those of us are a little older in the tooth, now I'll put it that way, uh, are, are, are seeing, seeing these throughout the years, throughout my years, um, as, getting, as getting worse and worse, aren't they? They're, they're just like they're building. Uh, and throughout the course of our lives, we, we, we're just amazed. I, I, to put it, I'm just amazed how lawlessness is prevailing over good. Uh, uh, just look what in the last three or four or five months, what's going on around the country. And, and the lawlessness, the rioting, the looting, it's just, just amazing. It seems like it's getting worse and worse. And um, as we're getting older, we, we see this. You know, I... I don't know, I guess it was when I was a younger and, you know, teens, 20s, whatever. But it seems like as I get older, it's like, it's just like it's getting worse. Anyhow, um, it seems like you, you always have to be on your guard nowadays for everything. Even uh, you get robocalls. You get these calls. And how many of you get the calls about your, your, um, um, your cars and your car warranty? And... Um, you know, if you wouldn't know any better, 
you know, they tell you to press these numbers and, you know, you have to be a little bit smarter and not press the numbers uh, because you, you just don't know. And uh, especially if you don't have a car warranty. And, and even if you have a car warranty and you think, well, wait a minute, that's not up for another two or three years. So, you know, you just, they're just, people are getting, the, the imposters are getting so much smarter. Amen. It just seems like they're getting so much smarter. Um, uh, and just, just one of the reasons that we know we're in the last days. Amen. Um, uh, think of it this way. The Apostle Paul wrote this to, to his son in the faith, Timothy, 2,000 years ago. And it's like he, like, it's like he wrote it last year or yesterday. He, it's like he saw that, foresaw, wait, God, don't get me wrong. God foresaw all this. He knows, amen, he's the God who knows, he's the God who sees. Um, but, you know, he didn't write these things to scare us. He wrote these things to prepare us, amen? So we have to be not scared of all this is happening all around the country, all around the world. It prepares us for the last days. And we're going to talk about that because as a Christian and as a believer, you know, we have to look for signs. Uh, not not that we have to have a sign to believe, don't get me wrong, but signs point us towards something. Amen. Signs point us towards something. Like if you're going in town to Montrose, it's a Montrose six miles or whatever. We know we're going in the right direction. Amen. And the Bible uh, speaks to those things that are pointing us in the right direction. Amen. That's what Bible prophecy is all about. A lot of people are scared of Bible prophecy, but Bible prophecy actually points us in the direction uh, towards Jesus, towards his second coming, and uh, all that's being fulfilled even today, amen, in Bible prophecy. Um, uh, the Bible points us in the direction of signs. Signs point us somewhere. Uh, a few months ago, our men's Bible study did, um, oh, four or five weeks, six weeks, on uh, eschatology, a uh, study of the Re book of Revelations and the end days. And um, they were um, uh, uh, videos uh, out of YouTube. Anybody can, uh, you know, watch them. And one of them for four weeks was by uh, a pastor from Texas. Uh, his name is Jimmy Evans. And uh, when he was done the four weeks, even after the first week, we just looked at each other and said, wow. Wow, that you know, it real, just really opens your eyes because the scriptures, you know, people say, well, we don't know when he's coming, but but scriptures point us towards when he's coming. Uh, no, don't get me wrong; nobody knows the day or the hour. Don't don't get me wrong, but but scripture points us uh, towards the second coming of Christ, and it was it was such an eye opener in, for all for all of us that were there for those four weeks and the couple we had after that by somebody else. Uh, it was just so good. So if you go to YouTube, YouTube, just uh, punch in end times prophecy and push in Jimmy Evans. And uh, he he, wrote, he gave four, a series of four out of his latest book. And it won't be hard to find, but it just really is like, man, that is really good. How even back in the book of Daniel points us towards the number of years and a number of days and and uh, in Nehemiah and it's just it's just amazing how the scriptures come alive when really when you have somebody that God has anointed to teach those things so um, so anyhow we went through that uh, so what do we what do we as believers do to prepare ourselves to not only survive these last days but to thrive in these last days because, you know, God just doesn't want us to survive. He just doesn't want us just to hang on by, by a thread or whatever, you know, but, but he wants us to thrive. It's the, it's the time for the church to thrive. Amen. He, he wants us to be the salt and light on the earth that the Bible says we're supposed to be. Amen. Until we go home to be with him, we're to be the salt and light of the earth. Amen. It doesn't matter what's going on around the country. It doesn't matter what's going on in the government. Jesus is Lord. Amen. Jesus is in control. Amen. Uh, look at verse 12. If you're in 2 Timothy 3, look at verse 12. It says, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus 
will suffer persecution. Now, a lot of people don't like that. And a lot of people don't think they have to suffer persecution. Well, I'm a Christian, you know, and I know what the scripture says. And, you know, I stand on Psalm 91 and I stand on Psalm 103 and, and we could go on and on. And I, and I do the same thing. Amen. I stand on, I believe Psalm 91. I know all you out there do too. But, um, you know, if, if we're living a godly life, if we're going to suffer persecution for Christ. Amen. Jesus said, it's not you they hate, it's me they hate. So it's the Jesus in me that the Holy Spirit is bringing out of me that the world, the ungodly people hate. The ungodly people hate. Um, Christians all around the world are suffering persecution. Amen. Missionaries all around the world are dying daily. Not just one at a time, dozens upon dozens. There, if you watch the news, and a lot of I know a lot of news don't put that on, but but uh, if you. Uh, I get uh, every other month uh, a magazine by the Book of the Martyrs uh, International, and it's just amazing the stories you read, how people are persecuted for Christ and what they go through, imprisoned and beaten. We think we have it hard here because somebody makes fun of us because of our beliefs, and you know we get our our, our thin skin feelings hurt. And but these people are suffering beatings and even dying uh, on. Uh, all because of Jesus. So the Bible says we're going to suffer persecution, amen? But the Bible also says we're supposed to stand out and not stand down, amen? It's, we're supposed to stand out, not stand down. And now is, not, now is the time, now is the time for the church to be vocal and not be silent, amen? And that is happening. Don't get me wrong. That's happening all around the country, especially in California and New York where where churches are told they can only have 10 people at a time. These enormous churches, well, you can only have 10 people there. And uh, uh, churches are standing up. They're not taking it. Amen. They're not taking it anymore. I know, see pastors from all around the country on Facebook and, and uh, they're speaking to you and, and uh, you know what? We're not taking it. We, we have a constitutional right to do what we're doing, and the government is not going to tell us what to do. He's not, they're not going to put our, their thumb on us. They're not going to keep us down. We're going to get back up, and we're going to do what God has called us to do. So churches all over the country are doing that. They're standing up and not standing down. They're being vocal and not being silent. Amen. Uh, David cried out. David said, I cry out with all my heart. And that's what we're supposed to do every single day. Amen. Cry out with all of our heart. Amen. Amen. Um, well, you may think, well, well, well if God has a plan, if, if uh, God has a plan in the Bible uh, and he has a timetable, which God has a timetable, don't get me wrong, uh, he doesn't really need me. Well, but you know what? God has always and always will work through people. He has always and always will work through people to accomplish his plans and purposes here on the earth. You know, he didn't part the Red Sea by himself. He said, Moses, stretch, stretch out your hand with the rod. He said, Moses, strike the rock, strike the rock with a rod. You know, he could have done it by himself, but he, and we could go on and on and on in scriptures where God uses people to do the miraculous. Amen. Because we are, we are his hand and feet. And does God still do the miraculous? Absolutely. Only God could provide manna for 40 years for millions of people every single day. Only God could do that, amen? Only God could feed Elijah from the mouth of a raven where there was a where was no food. Only God can do that. So there's a lot of things. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of things that only God can do. But God works through his people. He works through our hands. He works through our feet. He works through our, our voice, what we say and what we speak. And he is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, amen? God is faithful. Amen. God is faithful. When it seems like lawlessness is abounding, the scriptures say, and it is, isn't it? It is. God is faithful. And, you know, we can be encouraged by the scriptures instead of saying, man, things just don't look good. Things just don't look good. Amen. But be encouraged tonight, brothers and sisters, that, that God is faithful. God has a plan. God has a purpose. And God is a timetable. Amen. God is a timetable. And we are privileged, amen, privileged to be at this point 
in God's timetable. Amen. Uh, and be encouraged. God is light. God is light. And there is no, Bible says there is no darkness in him. So when we see darkness all around the country, stuff happening, you know, we can be reminded that, that God is not in it because God is light. Amen. So tonight, tonight I want to take some, some time here and, um, and look at three things. If we can look at three things, um, that we need to prepare ourselves for these last days, in these last days, not for them, but in them, because we're already in them. We're not preparing for something that's going to happen 10 years from now. We're preparing for what's going on right now in the world today. Amen. That's what we need to know. You know, how do, what do I do? Uh, what, what do I need to say? What do I need to know in these last days? How can I be encouraged what can I, how can I be encouraged by the scriptures so I won't get discouraged, get depressed? And, you know, that's happening all around the country, isn't it? People have to be quarantined and, and you can't do this and you can't do that. And, you know, the government continually putting their thumb on us uh, to, to, uh, to, to, I believe, to suppress us. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. This is very real what's going on. And, you know, what we do have to do is be smart, amen, be smart, do the right things, amen, and do the right things. But but what do I do? You know, what do I do in the in these last days that I can prepare myself and and be a Christian that, that not only survives, you know, we're not surviving these last days, we're not surviving this pandemic, but we're thriving through it, amen? And I, I hope wherever you're going to church, is teaching you, you know, how to not only survive, but to thrive in these last days. So if you're in 2 Timothy chapter 3, where we just read out of, you know, uh, let's read verse 14. We read through 1 through 13. Look at verse 14. And if you don't have a Bible, verse 14 says to Paul saying to Timothy, his son in the faith, he says, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of knowing from whom you have learned them. So these three things I'm going to talk about all have the word continue in them. And you know, this isn't some uh, deep theological thing that I studied in all week. This is something that you read in your Bible can say, wow, I, I must continue. And so you go into your study Bible. I hope you have a study Bible. You, you go into your study Bible. Where is the word continue? You know, look in your um, concordance in the back of your of your Bible and look for the word continue. And you can look up these things for yourself. You don't have to wait uh, for a Friday night, a Wednesday night, or a Tuesday night, or a Sunday morning. You can look these things up yourself. But look what the Bible says. Paul says to Timothy, you must continue. You must continue. Now, uh, Timothy, who was um, the Apostle Paul's son in the faith, was the um, pastor at, at the church in Ephesus. And he was experiencing uh, some really hard times, uh, some really tough times. They had a big church, and it was a thriving church. Uh, if you read the book uh, uh, of Ephesians, you know, the Apostle Paul uh, did a lot of teaching and did a lot of encouraging the saints, and, and uh, Timothy was the pastor there, but it was a multicultural church. There was a lot of things going on, and uh, he was experiencing uh, some hardships in that, uh, like the, the Jews, um, even, even the, uh, the born-again Jews were, um, were trying to uh, get their practices in. You know, it was a, a, their worldly ways. Uh, it, the Ephesus was an extremely uh, big area for witchcraft and Satanism and, and the occult and um, pagan practices. And uh, they were all um, creeping their way into the church. And the Apostle Paul was encouraging. If you read through the, the books of First and Second Timothy, uh, you can see how the Apostle Paul was continually encouraging Timothy, look, you have to continue to do these things. And that's what we're seeing here. Um, Paul's word to Timothy right here and other places was continue in what you know to be true. See, that's that's part of the problem that I see. I see around the country 
and all over the place that um, people are, are giving in to things that aren't true. That they're just they're just uh, they're just saying, well, that must be true, so I have to do that instead of studying, instead of knowing, instead of reading, instead of going to the Word and saying, wow, that's not even true. So uh, we have to continue in what we know to be true. And Paul said here, didn't he? He says, uh, have been learned and have been assured of. So see, Timothy, not uh, unlike a lot of us, you know, I didn't get saved till I was 22. You know, I didn't go to Sunday school all my life when I was when I was a kid in church. I didn't I didn't go through you know all these things that you know a, a young person going through Sunday school when they're a child and early teens and all that have learned these things. But you know. Paul said to Timothy, look, you learn these things and you know their truth. You must continue in them, amen? You've had good teachings. He says that, didn't he? He says that um, uh, from whom you have learned them. From whom you have learned them. Um, so Timothy, Timothy, don't give in to the, to the popular opinion of that day. And that's what seems like it's going on. What It must be, it's somebody's opinion, so it must be true. Amen. That's why we have to read the word. That's why we have to have a fellowship with God that, that the Holy Spirit can speak to us and, and let us know when, when something, that's what discernment, I've said this before, that's what discernment is all about. Discernment is not right and wrong. Discernment is, is right and almost right. Because the things that, that seem almost right are like, wow, that's, that seems pretty good. I can do that. Maybe I can make money. Or maybe I can do that and I can gain popularity. When in the end, it might work for a short season, but if it's not God, it won't go any further. Amen? If it's God, it won't go any further than what your flesh will take you in it. Amen? So we have to be assured of the things that we know. Amen? That's why it's good, it's, it's necessary to be in a good Bible-believing church. Amen? And if I might add a good spirit-filled Bible-believing church. Amen? I know some of you are saying amen out there. So the word continue... The word continue, I know you're all waiting for this in the Greek, is the word meno. Listen to what it says, to, it means to habitually abide. When you're continuing in something, you're, con, you're habitually abiding in something. It means to stay put. And, and my version is, it means to plant your feet, amen, and not be moved. And that, that's, that seems like that's what's happening so much. You know, we're, we're being moved. We're being tossed about like the waves of the, of the sea, the Bible, the Bible talks about. And we're not, we're not planting our feet. We're not being steadfast. We're not, and we're not continuing in the things that we know. Paul told him the same thing. If you have a Bible, if you don't listen to it, Paul told him the same thing in 2 Timothy 1, verses 13 and 14. Listen to what it says. Um, verse 13 in 2 Timothy 1 says, Hold fast. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That good thing, it says that good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. So here we see again, and if you read through First and Second Timothy, Apostle Paul is, is using strong words to, to encourage Timothy and the believers there in the church of Ephesus to continue and what they need to do, amen? And that's what we need to do in these last of the last days. We're privileged, just privileged to live in, amen? Um, and what it takes, amen, what it takes is is commitment. Man, what it takes is dedication, amen? And that's, it seems like, I don't mean to be a, a doubting Thomas or anything else, but it seems like that's what the church is lacking. We're lacking dedication. We're lacking commitment to fulfill the scriptures and God's call and plan for our life. So we have to hold fast. We have to continue in the things that we know, the things that we've learned, the things we've grown up in and been assured of. We have to continually hold fast, amen, and continue in those things. Um, it's how we experience, if you go back to 2 Timothy 3 again, it's how we experience verse 17. It's how we experience verse 17, 2 Timothy 3, 17. It says that the man of God, not the woman of God also, don't, don't uh, send me any nasty 
uh, notes, but the man or woman of God, just be politically correct here, uh, may be complete. See that? I don't know what your version says. My version says may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So see, when we continue in the things that we know to be true, if we continue in the truth of God's word, you know, we're going we're gonna to be built up in our most holy faith, the Bible says in Jude. We're going to be uh, not being washed, up, uh, uh, or tossed around like the waves of the sea. Amen. We're going to be, what does it say? Complete and thoroughly equipped. That word complete in the Greek is the word plero, and it means to be filled up to the very top, to be complete, to, to flourish because we're completely filled up. No more room for anything else. And that's what God wants for our life. Amen. If you go back to chapter 2, um, right here in 2 Timothy, chapter 2, look at verse 20 and 21. It's a little bit different, but look at what it says. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, verse 24, therefore, because of that, because of what would just, that's what therefore means. Therefore, because of what we just said previously, if anyone cleanses himself, say, well, oh God, you do this, you do that. God, if you want me to clean, if you want me, whatever, get off of it, be, not be addicted, you do it. But, you know, sometimes we have to take some personal responsibility. Amen. And it says, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of, for honor, a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master. Amen. As a Christian, that's what we want to be, don't we? We want to be useful for the master, prepared, look at it there, prepared for every good work. Amen. Don't you want to be prepared for every good work? Don't you want to be ready? Don't you want to be ready when that opportunity arises in Rite Aid and Price Chopper, wherever you're at, whatever area you're in? Don't you want to be prepared and ready that that when something occurs that 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 somebody beside you needs help, somebody in front of you needs a dollar, somebody um, in front of you needs prayer, amen, that you're ready, that you're ready for every good work. The Bible says that Jesus, that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with power, amen, with power to do every good work, amen, that's what God wants for us. He wants for us the same thing he wanted for Jesus. You know, we're Jesus' hands and feet. They said, go, this is, this is what Jesus uses. He uses your hands to lay hands on the sick. He uses your hands to help somebody. He uses your feet to, to go to somebody that's in need. He uses your mouth to speak encouraging words and, and hope to somebody else. We need hope these days, don't we? It seems like things are hopeless, but they're not. Amen, they're not, because God, God is faithful. Amen, God is faithful, amen. So here he says there, same thing, doesn't he? That you may be um, prepared for every good work, amen. Uh, brothers and sisters, if we don't continue... Amen. If we don't continue, we're not, we're, we're, we're going to get run over. Amen. If you're not prepared, if you're not continuing in the things that you know, and you say, well, I don't really know that much. Continue in what you know. Continue in what you know. Amen. And do the work of the ministry. Amen. Ephesians chapter four, do the work of the ministry. That's just not for for Pastor Rob or I or your minister at your church, well, I'll just call them and they'll do that. No, that's for you to do. You do the work of the ministry. You go and lay hands on the sick. You you lead somebody to Jesus. You make disciples. Amen? You do it. You do it. Amen? You do it. If we don't, we're going to get run over about what we read in verses 1 through 13. Amen? That's what we're living in today. Aren't we? If you read verses 1 through 13 with me, that's what we're living in today. And we, we could, I'm not going to go back over and, and read that, but that's what we're living in. You know, this is all around us. This is in our own families. Amen? This is in our own families. This, this list back in, in, in chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 or whatever and continuing, this is, this is in our own families. This is what we're living in. Amen? So we have to be prepared. We have to have an answer 
Doesn't the Bible say they have to have an answer for the hope that's in us? You can't just have somebody ask you a question and, say, and you say, well, you know what, let me go get my pastor. Eh, it doesn't work that way, does it? And most of the time, that uh, you have to have an answer. Amen? You can't be dumbfounded. You can't be tongue-tied by something that you don't know. You have to have an answer. So anyhow, we have to continue. That's what uh, Paul says to Timothy. And then uh, we're going to look at something else. Go to the book of Colossians. The book of Colossians chapter 4. That's, that's continue in the faith. Continue in the things that you know. The second continue is in Colossians chapter 4. And we're just going to read verse 2 and 12. Can we do that? Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 and 12. And wouldn't you know it, the word continue is in here too? I'm telling you, you could look these things up. You could be a Bible scholar in, in no time by having a good concordance. A concordance, if you have a, a good Bible study that points you in, into the other scriptures and a good concordance in the back of it, man, you could be a... Um, whatever, next Billy Graham, amen? But uh, look at, if you're in Colossians chapter four, look at verse two and verse 12. The apostle Paul says in the book, uh, Church of Coloss, uh, continue earnestly in prayer. So you know where we're going next. We're gonna talk about prayer. Uh, being vigilant, for, here at first he says earnestly in prayer. Then he says being vigilant in it, in prayer. So he says, look, you're supposed to be earnest and vigilant in prayer with thanksgiving. Amen. And look at verse 12 in chapter 4, verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, in other words, he was in the church there, a bondservant of Christ, greets you always, listen to what it says here, always laboring fervently for you in what? In prayers. Always, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may why that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God there that word is perfect and complete like we read in in uh, 2 Timothy 4 or 3 perfect and complete thoroughly equipped amen we could say you need you, you can be thoroughly equipped in Christ amen amen it takes commitment it takes prayer and we have to be we have to what Mino, it continue. Then to say that continue means habitually provide, habitually abide, stay put, plant your feet. You know, in prayer. Don't move in prayer. Don't get discouraged when things don't go your way. Don't get discouraged when when your prayer isn't answered uh, in the in the first five minutes or or five hours or five days or five weeks. Keep your feet planted in prayer. Continue in them what? Earnestly and vigilantly. Amen. Uh, sometimes, um, sometimes I ask myself, well, how did they do it? How did the people in the Bible do it? And how did, how do missionaries do it that are being persecuted every day, that are being martyred every day? Uh, how did they do it? And I guarantee you, I guarantee you, they'll all tell you it comes only by prayer and fasting. Amen. I, I, when I was in Brazil with, with Fred and Paula, Bolly, right at the edge of the, of, the, uh, of the Amazon, right before you get into the, the deep jungle, you know, we would have devotions every morning with them. And as we were walking out to the job site, uh, almost immediately we could hear them. The, um, we were like, a half a mile away working, you know, we could hear them uh, singing and worshiping. We could hear them praying. So I know, I know prayer. I know if we could have them on Facebook Live, they would tell you that the only thing that kept them going is trusting God in prayer. So we have to be vigilant. We have to um, constantly be in touch with the Father. And, you know, there, there's so many stories that we could talk about in, in, in continuing prayer. The, the pastor from Modesto, California, uh, last week was his one-year anniversary that he died. He had a coronary. I've told this story from the pulpit a couple of times. He got into his car after prayer meeting and had a coronary. He was dead. There's no coming back from a coronary. They got him to the hospital. They revived him. He died seven times. 
There was 13 machines keeping him alive. I saw the picture. I saw the picture. There's, thir there's machines all around him, tubes. You couldn't hardly see his face or anything. There was tubes keeping him alive. They pulled his wife and sons aside several times and said, there, there's no coming back. And if he would come back, his mind wouldn't be there or his, his organs wouldn't function. His liver is dead and the, so on. And they kept telling them, just give God a chance. We had people all over the country praying for him. Please just give God a chance. So they would give God a chance. All of a sudden, he opened one eye. And the whole story is within, within a week, he was up walking around because saints everywhere around the world were praying. They were praying the same. They were praying in one accord. So it's, it says, when it says earnestly and vigilantly, I guarantee you they were praying earnestly and vigilantly. So we need to seek God's heart in prayer. We need to seek God's will. They, they give themselves over to prayer. When the 12 apostles in, um, in Acts chapter 6, they got so busy. Uh, they got so busy. By this time in Acts chapter 6, it was told that there was 100,000 people that got saved. In five short chapters. Anyhow, no, that's just a joke. Um, but uh, they were looking for seven men of faith to carry on ministering to the people. Ministering to the people. And it says uh, in verse 4, Acts 6, it says, We will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. No, listen, there was 100,000 people. They needed to pray. They needed to pray. That's a lot of mouths to fill, amen? They needed to pray. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says, And they continued, continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayers. So see, we, we can't give up. We have to continue to pray. Continue to bombard the gates of heaven, amen? Continue to pray. Epaphras in, in verse 12 was praying for the church at Coloss. He wanted them to be perfect and complete. And you know what? I just what I, what I sense that, that this man, Epaphras, was, was probably at one time um, a person that, that wasn't complete, that he wasn't where he was at that time. And he wanted his fellow believers in the church to be built up to the place where he was. So he was continually, vigilantly praying for them. Amen. He probably remembered the hard times he went through. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of what we're going through today, maybe. Amen. And he said, look, I'm, I'm, I'm praying for you. Uh, what does it say? Uh, laboring fervently. Those are pretty strong words. Laboring fervently in prayer. Amen. Think of it this way. Uh, why would we not why would we not be in constant communication with the one that has all the answers? Amen. Why would we not? Why would we, you know, uh, my, my pastor back at your Christian fellowship, he used to say, reach for your Bible before you reach for the bottle. Maybe we need a prescripture before we need a prescription. That's pretty good. You ought to write that down, Scott. Maybe we need a pre scripture before we need a prescription. Amen. You ought to write that down. I'll probably forget that. That's pretty good. Anyhow, uh, the third thing we're going to talk about is in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 13. I want to finish up with this. Oh my, and it was that late. Sorry about that. Sorry to keep you up, Deb. But anyhow, um, look at Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Let's talk about one more thing here about continuing. Well, when you know this scripture has continuing in it. Therefore, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. Therefore, by him, let us, oh, here's that word again. Let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So we're continually to be praising. Continue, don't, look, don't let your guard down. Don't go from your house in town. Uh, and let the devil bombard you with fiery darts and negative things. You know, turn off the country music and turn on the praise music. Push in that CD or whatever, you know, but bombard your mind with the praises of God. And you know, you know what? When it's just you and, and, and God in the vehicle, God don't care what you sound like. 
Amen. God, the word, just making a joyful noise to the Lord. Amen. So we're continually in praise and, and prayer and, and worship. But you know what I noticed here? Let, can I just talk about something for a couple minutes? Uh, why does it say the sacrifice of praise? Why does it say the sacrifice of praise? Look at it this way. In the Old Testament, when the, in the Old Testament, when they sacrificed something, something died. When they sacrificed something, something died. An animal died. Um, several times it says, I read this, uh, several times it says a sweet smelling aroma to the Lord. The sacrifice, when they did it God's way, it said a sweet smelling sacrifice to the Lord. Well, you might say, well, that's Old Testament, Pastor Tim. We're in, we're New Testament. We're, we walk in grace now, not in the law. Okay. All right. Well, then you did it. Let's go to Philippians chapter four. Go to Philippians chapter four. Well, I have a hard time finding that. Well, listen. G-E-P-C. Go eat popcorn. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Okay. Or General Electric Power Company. You might have your own words, but but uh, go to the book of Philippians. We're almost done. Hang in there. Hang in there. You can go to bed in a couple minutes. It's not 8 o'clock. Your, your shows aren't on yet. But uh, go to Philippians chapter 4. Well, that's Old Testament. That's sacrifice stuff. That's Old Testament. Well, look at Philippians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul is talking to the church of Philippi. And he's talking about, uh, here's another stumbling block. We, he's talking about giving. He's talking about your money right now, okay? And we've all heard this, hopefully, in church. But look at it says, uh, let's just read verse 18. I don't want to go through the whole thing. It would take another half an hour. But um, look at verse 18, Philippians 4, 18. It says, Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable an acceptable sacrifice. What's it say? You read it. Well pleasing to God. So their giving, their giving was sacrificial. And if you read through, they didn't they didn't have a chance to give all the time. Maybe they didn't have the money to give. Just like us sometimes, you and I, we don't have the money to give and our or we give over and above sometimes. So our giving is sacrificial. And look what it says. This is what my Bible, I'm not making this up. Uh, it says, uh, a sweet smelling aroma. Just like if you read the Old Testament. Uh, yeah, you need to read the Old Testament too. But it says, a sweet smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice. Well pleasing to God. So, apparently, this church gave sacrificially. Sacrificially. Physical, okay, it's time to stop. They were giving out of their need. They were giving out of their brokenness. They were giving out of their, their hurt, their want, or whatever. Um, uh, their pride, whatever. Their, their, their pride died. Their, their selfishness died. Their, their thinking that I can do it all my own died. And I'm giving sacrificially to God. Listen, do we praise and worship God sometimes sacrificially. Maybe we don't feel like it. Well, I just don't feel like it today. You know what? You need to get over your feelings. And feelings are fickle. Amen. They're always going to be there, but what we have to go by is the truth. Amen. Go by is the truth. Uh, things look bleak, God. And, you know, I just don't have it to give, or I just don't feel like worshiping. That's the times where God loves worship. When you're when you're praising and worshiping out of your brokenness out of your hurt, out of your confusion, out of your, your dire need. is and When you worship God, that's a sacrifice of praise. We need to do more of sacrificial praising where we, where we lay down our pride, where we lay down our, our selfishness, our self-centeredness, and worship God and let God just overwhelm us. Let God be pleased with us. Amen? Too many times we worship God because, oh, I like the song because it sounds good or it has good melody or not because it's anointed, but because it sounds good. Let me tell you, can I just say this? 
th this might not sound right coming from a pastor, but uh, there's songs on the radio that, and when I hear them, it, it's either in my mind or in my spirit. You know what? That that's that's not right. That's not that's not a a, a sacrificial song. That song, and you can just tell when songs aren't anointed. Amen. You can tell when songs aren't anointed, and um, but we have to fill ourselves with with anointed praise and worship songs. Amen. It just gets us through the tough times. It'll get us through the tough times. These end of last days that we're going through today, and these these next years or whatever months ahead till Jesus comes. Um, pure praise. Here's what the Lord spoke to me. Pure praise conquers pure darkness. Pure praise conquers pure darkness. Are we are we giving a sacrifice of praise? Is our is our praise and worship pure before the Lord? Or are we doing it just to be seen or just to be heard? Or because I have a nice voice, I sing louder. Listen, listen, you know why I sit right in front of the speakers? Oh, because you're the pastor. No, I sit in front of the speakers because nobody else can hear me. Now, sometimes I can't even hear myself. That's why I tell Carl to jack the music up because... I can't even hear myself. I can sing as loud, but God hears me. Amen. God hears me. And to me, it's a sacrifice because when you, when you really don't have a good voice to sing, you know, you, you just belt it out anyhow. That's, that's part of sacrificing a praise. Are we continually, habitually putting our foot in the sand or in the concrete and continuing in the things that we've known and we learned? Are we continuing earnestly in prayer, and are we continuing earnestly in worship and praise in our lives? I pray that you are. I pray that this encouraged you. That's all I wanted to do tonight, encourage you uh, to continue in the things of God. Amen. Amen. Have a great weekend if you're hunting. Have a great uh, uh, Saturday, Sunday, not Sunday. I know you're going to be in church on Sunday. Don't get me wrong. I know where you're going to be. But it's going to be a nice day. You can hunt in the afternoon. So anyhow, have a great weekend and be blessed.